이스라엘 선교 전문 방송 브레드 t v 에서 매년 봄과 가을에 진행하고 있는 이스라엘 회복 순례가 2016년 가을에도 출발합니다. 사랑해요 이스라엘 2016년 가을에도 역시 이스라엘을 처음 가는 분들을 위한 올리브 코스와 이스라엘의 색다른 장소, 색다른 경험을 원하는 분들을 위한 무화과 코스 두 차례 진행됩니다. 9월 12일부터 8박 9일간 진행되는 올리브 코스는 예수님이 태어나신 베들레헴, 예수님이 사역하셨던 갈릴리 호수, 또 예수님이 눈물로 기도하셨던 겟세만의 동산과 십자가를 지고 가셨던 고난의 길, 그리고 골고다 언덕 같은 기본적인 성지 코스는 물론이고 핍박과 고난 속에서도 신앙을 지키고 있는 메시아닉 주 교회에 가서 그들의 손을 잡고 위로하며 예배를 드리고 또 영화 회복의 주인공들을 만나 그들이 얼마나 간절하게 예수님을 믿는지 간증을 직접 들으며 그들의 손을 잡고 함께 중보 기도를 하는 시간을 가지려고 합니다. 9월 19일부터 8박 9일간 진행되는 무화과 코스는 역시 기본적인 성지 코스를 방문하는 것뿐만 아니라 예루살렘 중심에 있는 기도타워를 방문해 예루살렘을 한눈에 내려다보며 정말 예루살렘의 평화를 위해서 기도하고 또 메시아닉 주 교회에서 그들과 함께 예배를 드릴 것입니다. 좀더 특별한 이스라엘을 체험하기 위해서 예루살렘의 재래시장을 방문하여 그들의 생활과 문화를 이해하는 시간도 가지려고 합니다. 네개부 사막의 베두인 텐트 아래에서 모닥불을 피워놓고 벌어지는 메시아닉 주와 함께하는 찬양과 간증의 밤은 아마 여러분에게 평생 잊지 못할 지난 감동과 은혜의 시간을 선사하게 될 것입니다. 제가 만든 이스라엘 영화를 이스라엘 현지에서 관람하고 그 촬영 현장과 영화의 출연자들을 만나는 시간 그리고 그 현장에서 들려주는 하나님의 놀라운 역사의 간증들을 들려드릴 것입니다. 저와 함께 떠나는 이스라엘 회복 순례는 기존의 성지 순례와는 그 차원이 다르죠. 이스라엘은 더 이상 관광이나 순례의 대상이 아닙니다. 우리의 기도와 관심이 필요한 대상이죠. 그런데도 과거의 유적지만 돌아다니며 사진만 찍다가 오는 성지 순례를 하시겠습니까? 아니면 현재 하나님께서 이스라엘을 통해서 어떻게 역사하고 계신지 그 현장을 직접 확인하는 시간을 갖고 이스라엘을 위해서 기도하는 시간을 가지시겠습니까? 여행은 어디를 가느냐도 중요하지만 누구와 함께 가느냐가 더 중요하죠 여러분 저와 함께 이스라엘 가시죠 제가 여러분을 이스라엘로 안내하겠습니다
There's a teddy bear still on her bed, a red beanbag chair, some pictures on the wall, shoes tightly packed in a bin next to her bunk bed. Why would any person do this? Netanyahu blamed incitement by the Palestinian Authority. Just three days before the murder of Ariel, a senior member of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas's political party told a newspaper, everywhere you see an Israeli, cut off his head. You don't murder a sleeping child for peace. You don't slit a little girl's throat to protest a policy you don't like. You do this because you've been brainwashed. You've been brainwashed by a warped ideology that teaches you that this child isn't human. Ariel was a U.S. citizen and cousin to a senior Israeli cabinet minister. The reality is that this incitement by Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas has resulted in the murdering of children. The vengeance of the Lord is the vengeance of the Lord, but our vengeance is continuing to build on this land. That's not the only terror attack here in the region. The attack at the Istanbul airport killed more than 40 and injured nearly 250. And a top U.S. security official is warning it's just a matter of time before a similar attack is attempted on U.S. soil. Caitlin Burke has that story. Turkish police forces conducting raids today targeting Islamic State suspects. This as investigators learn more about the coordinated attack at Istanbul's main airport. Three attackers, all with specific assignments. One went to the terminal, another to arrivals, and the third waited outside. The horror in Turkey prompting increased security at airports here at home, and also raising familiar questions about just how safe they actually are. If anybody here believes that the U.S. homeland is, is hermetically sealed and that the, the Daesh or ISIL uh, would not consider that, I think uh, I would... I would you know, guard against that. CIA Director John Brennan says that ISIS is determined to kill as many people as possible and to carry out attacks abroad. And he believes they'll continue trying to penetrate American defenses. In an interview with Yahoo News, he credited effective homeland security measures and intelligence for the fact that the terrorist group has so far been unable to attack America directly. The Orlando and San Bernardino shootings being carried out by radicals inspired by the group, but not under its direct control. One major vulnerability that terrorists took advantage of in not only Turkey, but also Belgium, is the fact that most airports don't have security screening for people before they enter the terminals. What's on the outside of an airport? Glass. And glass uh, with an explosive like that is going to cause a lot more damage from a fragment standpoint that's going to inflict mass casualties. Aviation security experts say that one of the main lessons for other airports is to have enough armed police to regularly patrol public spaces and to keep checkpoint lines moving so that crowds don't get big in vulnerable areas outside of the security perimeter. Something major airports here in the U.S. are now pledging to do. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. While ISIS seems to be the culprit behind the Istanbul attack, the way the Islamic State has become a power in the region has a lot to do with the five-year-old Syrian civil war. I talked with Middle East expert Jonathan Spire about the circumstances behind the rise of ISIS and the incredible human cost of the Syrian civil war. Jonathan, thanks for joining us on Jerusalem Dateline. Good to be here, Chris. Uh, you wrote an article not too long about at the anniversary, the five-year anniversary of the Syrian Civil War. What did you want to communicate in that article? Well, just uh, the, mainly the extent of the human loss, to be honest, Chris. I mean, I write a lot you know, of political analysis uh, about the various political and military aspects of the war. But I've also you know, reported on the ground in various parts of Syria and witnessed a lot of the, just the human suffering that's, that's going on. Human beings inside Syria, on all sides, have suffered in the course of this war. You know, nearly 10 million people made homeless, almost half the population, maybe 400,000 people dead. You know, the sheer magnitude of what's happening in Syria, you know, it's something that I think needs to get across, especially because to some extent, there's been a kind of waning of uh, global media attention on the Syrian war. 
uh, in the course of the last, I would say, year or so, because other things are going on. And, you know, we still need to be aware of just how many people are suffering and just what needs to, to be done then. And of course, the other thing I wanted to convey in that article, and I think it's important to remember, is that this war, you know, is nowhere close to finishing. We had, of course, the ceasefire coming in this year, on February 27th, it held for a while, but it's now you know, conclusively broken down. Fighting's taking place across the country once again. Why should people in the West and, and Europe care about what's going on in Syria? Well, to some degree, especially with Europeans, need to care because, of course, Syrian refugees are trying to make their way across into Europe, and that's causing enormous strain on European societies who are not necessarily well prepared to receive those newcomers or who don't wish to receive those newcomers. So from that point of view, I think the Europeans definitely need to care. With regard to the United States, well, there's been a sense in which the US has chosen to kind of uh, absent itself from close engagement in the Middle East, I think, in recent years. There's been a certain weariness, maybe understandable, of the part of the American public in terms of the, that uh, engagement after the unsuccessful wars, I would say, in Iraq and Afghanistan. But Syria, I think, is kind of an example of what happens when America is not involved to keep that security architecture in the region, to deter enemies, to make sure the bad guys stay out, then what you get is you get things like the Syrian civil war. So in that respect, I think that has to, you know, that has to be of interest to, uh, to the United States too. Has this been uh, responsible for the rise of ISIS? Uh, absolutely, yes. I mean, if we remember that ISIS, of course, comes out of Iraq, and ISIS comes out of the Al-Qaeda branch uh, in Iraq, and that was a body that was effectively defeated, largely by the United States and its uh, Sunni tribal allies in western Iraq in the uh, course of the, la the latter part of the last decade. And what the Syrian war did is it gave ISIS the chance for a new lease of life. You know, the, the, the scattered remnants of the Islamic State in Iraq group came into Syria, into the uh, vacuum that had opened up in Syria in the course of 2012, 2013, began to reorganize themselves, captured territory on the ground, drove other rebels out. And then, of course, in the dramatic events of the summer of 2014, you know, reinvaded back into Iraq and established now this entity, which is now tottering a little bit, but this entity calling itself the Islamic State uh, or the Caliphate. So yes, absolutely, without the vacuum that opened up as a result, of the Syrian civil war, it's very hard to imagine how that Islamic State in Iraq that became the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria could have got itself back on its feet. And how would you characterize the strength of ISIS right now? ISIS is uh, weakening, I think. I mean, ISIS, you know, we're seeing is losing its territorial holdings inside uh, Iraq and inside Syria. Obviously, they've lost Ramadi. The latest to go is now the town of Fallujah in the last 24 hours. In Syria, the Kurdish-led uh, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces with US air power backing them up are heading for the town of Menbij, close to the border. So everywhere we look, uh, ISIS territorial holdings are being reduced by a variety of enemies, uh, usually uh, with the backing of Western air power and Western special forces on the ground, and that's good news. Uh, the bad news, so to speak, is that as ISIS contracts physically in terms of its territorial holdings on the ground, what we're likely to see, I think, unfortunately, is an increasing use of, of international terrorism by ISIS. ISIS going from a territorial power on the ground back to what it was before, namely a kind of transnational terror organization. And I think if we look at the increasing number, the increasing list of uh, international terrorist actions taken by ISIS in the course of the last year, France, in, in, in Brussels, and so on and so forth, then I think we're already, you know, that, that's the pattern of events to come, I think. Well, Jonathan, thanks for your expertise and analysis. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Chris. Always good to talk to you. Muslims right now are celebrating the Feast of Ramadan. As Tom Doyle from E3 Ministries reminds us, a number of ministries, including CBN, are partnering together to pray for Muslims during the feast. This was an opportunity, Chris, where we could bring ministries together, let our followers know that we were gonna have a global prayer cast for Muslims during Ramadan. So we took the last seven days leading up to that uh, night of power, night of destiny, and it's gonna start June 25th and it'll end July 2nd. So every night at 8.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, there'll be a short Facebook Live prayer time where someone will share an inspirational story, a prayer need from the Middle East or around the world for Muslims, and, and pray with the believers on the air. 
and we have some all-stars, really some all-stars. Voice of the Martyrs, The Crescent Project, Fouad Masri, uh, Heather Mercer, Global Hope, CBN 700 Club, uh, E3 Partners, Hazem Faraj, just lots of groups of people that are saying, let's connect all of our followers together and join together. Chris, we're talking, it could be hundreds of thousands of people praying on those nights for Muslims to have an encounter with Jesus. Coming up, hear the shocking accusation of how the U.S. government has hidden traces of one of the world's biggest terror groups. Whistleblower Philip Haney recently testified before U.S. Senate subcommittee. He also told CBN's Jennifer Wishon about his experiences at the Department of Homeland Security and about how the ties between radical Islam and terrorism were erased from government records and what really are the long-term goals of the jihadists. After the terrorist attack in Orlando, the Justice Department tried to redact all references the killer made to Islam during his 911 call. That blunder allowed the public to see the type of scrubbing that's been going on behind closed doors of the federal government for years. A systematic erasing of links between Islam and terrorism, according to Philip Haney, a longtime officer in the Department of Homeland Security. They told me, we want you to eliminate the word was modify. All the linking information in about 850 records that I put into the system on guess what group? The Muslim Brotherhood. That was in 2009, one year after President Obama was elected. Haney says Obama relied on the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamic groups with ties to terrorism to craft U.S. policy. And in 2012 it happened again. This time they didn't just modify the information in the records, they completely eliminated them out of the system, erased them forever. And then they investigated me for putting that information into the system when that's exactly the job that I was supposed to be doing. He's been investigated nine times. At one point, he was picked apart by three federal agencies at once. Haney was exonerated, but through his experiences came to realize spiritual warfare is taking place at the highest levels of government. I can't explain to you the ideology or the worldview of this administration that makes them so adamant to protect Islam from harm by addressing it in its true nature. How has your Christian faith helped you get through all of this? We're talking about very, very high level, malevolent, kind of uh, forces here at work and it is very sobering to see these kind of things operating. They're, these are biblical level events that we're talking about. His book, See Something, Say Nothing, details his tumultuous time at the Department of Homeland Security. After living in the Middle East and studying terrorism, Haney believes jihad is a tactic radical Muslims are using to achieve their goal of implementing Sharia law in the U.S., Europe, and around the world. The power of Sharia is very difficult to exaggerate how much influence it has on the life of Muslims around the world. You say this is a battle between the Constitution and Sharia law. Mm -hmm. Are we going to submit to the influence of Sharia law and make it legal for one particular religion to have more than one wife? Or are we going to say no, you cannot implement those provisions as long as you want to be a citizen of the United States? What America needs, he says, is to focus on the Constitution. And if you become more familiar with the Constitution, you'll be able to see more clearly the points of contact or conflict between the U.S. Constitution and Sharia law. And then you can discuss it without fear of being called a racist or a bigot or an Islamophobe. Jennifer Wishheim, CBN News, Washington. Up next. Find out what CBN Scott Ross found when he took a tour of the borders and boundaries of Jerusalem. When it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian talks, the subject of a divided Jerusalem is often the deal breaker for the Jewish state. 
but why? CBN Scott Ross takes a look at the answer. Jerusalem's old city, the Temple Mount, and the Mount of Olives all share common bonds. In addition to biblical significance, they're all in the part of the city Palestinians want as their future capital. Scripture says, Jerusalem is a city set on a hill. And we are standing on the hill, the Mount of Olives, and we are overlooking the Temple Mount. Beautiful <clears throat> vision here of the old city and behind it, the new city. Haim Silberstein, founder and president of Keep Jerusalem, believes the city must remain united. We spent a day looking at Jerusalem from different angles to understand its complexity. This is a city that's ensconced in geopolitics, in divisiveness, both within the Jewish people and certainly the Arab nations against the Jewish people. Jerusalem has been conquered more than any other city in history, yet it's been the only capital the Jewish people have ever known. Still, the world refuses to recognize it as Israel's capital, even though it's mentioned more than 640 times in the Old Testament and not once by name in the Koran. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. We know that over 3,000 years ago, King David came here, he conquered Jerusalem, and he set up his capital here. And for a thousand years, Israel had sovereignty, the Jews had sovereignty in the land of Israel. A pocket of Jews remained in, in Palestine, in Israel, throughout the centuries. But we only saw a real return of the Jewish people in the last 150 years or so. And today, when we look at Jerusalem, we see Jerusalem built up. At what point was it that the Arabs, uh, the Palestinians, uh, made a determination that this was their capital. It was only when the Israelis liberated Jerusalem in 67 that they changed that because they needed to get us out. So they then created this idea that they want a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital. On the world stage, Jerusalem is typically divided between east and west. The newer western city is primarily Jewish. The older eastern section stretches from north to south. The majority of the city's Arabs live there, but so do an almost equal number of Jewish Israelis. With the city as it is now and the talk of dividing Jerusalem, is that realistic, uh, a divided Jerusalem? I think that it would be a disaster of historic proportions and a huge mistake because dividing up Jerusalem will create the exact opposite effect of peace. Scott Ross, Jerusalem. Coming up, one of Jerusalem's oldest churches gets some much-needed repairs when we come back. Behind me, you can see the gray domes of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's believed to be the place where Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. And after 200 years, it's getting some critical renovations all made possible because of a rare agreement of the religious leaders that take care of the church. Deep in the heart of Jerusalem's Christian quarter lies the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's the place where many believe Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims visit the church each year. The Roman Emperor Constantine built the church more than 1,600 years ago. Over the centuries, it's been burnt, suffered from earthquakes, destroyed by Muslims, and reconstructed many times. The last repair work happened in 1810, when the Edicule or Mausoleum was rebuilt following a fire. After the earthquake of 1927, there was a kind of damage around the Edicule and even in the Edicule itself. Nothing happened then because as tour guide Saeed Rabie told us, the Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Armenian Orthodox churches responsible for the site's management couldn't agree on repairs. There is always a kind of a competition between the different denominations. Who will have the honor to pray more in such a place or to have a bigger part or to be the honor of serving the holy place? Now that leaders have put that competition aside, Professor Antonia Marapulo will lead the restoration project. We will uh, remove the marble slabs, the stone slabs. Uh, we will inject grouts to homogenize the complex structure, which is the holy rock. 
That means that uh, we develop a unified structure, that all the layers will behave structurally as one. And upon this, after um, repairing uh, with new compatible and performing mortars and concrete, we will readjust the stone slabs with titanium bolts. And the restoration takes in the tiniest details. We start with one method, and then we maybe we continue with another method, so that to have a very clean surface. As you can see here, you can tell the difference between the two surfaces. The three denominations and Jordan's King Abdullah will put up more than $3 million for the work, which should be complete by March 2017. Major repairs will happen at night so visitors aren't disturbed. For those working on the project, it's more than just a job. Of course, I'm very exciting. Yeah. Because I'm a Christian Orthodox and I am working in Greece in uh, monuments like this. But uh, this is a specialized project, very specialized project. I don't believe that I can go to something bigger than this. When you come to Jerusalem, you should visit the church to see how the renovations are coming. Well, that's it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.